Welcome back to Cult Radio A Go Go Live. And we're we are currently on the phone with our very special guest for the night. Ladies and gentlemen, a legend, an inductee of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Mr. Marky Ramone. Welcome to the show, Marky. Hi. Hi, everybody. Hey, Marky. This is Terry Defoe. This is Tiffany's father. How are you doing? All right. How are you? Well, I'm pretty good now. I've got Tiffany to actually settle down. She was doing the <laughs> Blitzkrieg bop all around the uh, studio here. Uh, that's, that's great. It's good to, to lose calories that way. <laughs> you know, it would have to take somebody like Marky Ramon for me to promote another radio station, which is Sirius and XM, and it's great what you're doing over there. Tell everybody about your radio show. Oh, thanks. Uh, I have a show on a Tuesday night, and it's Sirius XM since they merged. And it's 8 o'clock, and I just play uh, what I consider punk rock. And um, it's developed uh, over the course of four years, and... Um, I play new school, old school, middle school. I give bands a chance to, uh, you know, send in like their um, CDs, music, whatever, and uh, play them. And uh, and that's what I do. I feel a lot of these songs were too good not to be played, even when they did when they came out originally. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like uh, an introduction to um, something new because a lot of people didn't hear this stuff, you know. For sure. So what's it like being a DJ? I mean, you've been a musician for so long. Well, I'm both. I, uh, I swing both ways. I, I'll do DJ, and then I'll play. i go on the road for a while and uh, do my uh, uh, Ramon songs that I play with my band, and then I'll come back and do the shows. And Also, I do guest DJ appearances in, um, in, in other cities and countries. So it's just another... Uh, extension of the music uh, business fantastic well i must say that the way that you not only do what you do in your current career but also you know still keep the ramones flame uh, going i really appreciate the way you do things you do it with great respect and great dignity thank you absolutely I try. uh it's very hard when uh, three members are gone and you you go uh, you play in front of a whole new audience mm-hmm. i mean of course the older audience is there uh, out of curiosity, but you have to keep it at a quality level. You have to make sure that these people that are playing with me uh, are doing it right, and they have good attitudes, and they're focused, and they uh, they have it in them to be able to play that energy for that hour and 15, 20 minutes. Right. So, uh, yeah, I, I try to maintain a, a, a good level of quality when I do this, just because... Hey, you know, it's very hard to uh, compete, and I, don't, I would never compete with the Ramones. I just okay. feel the songs, again, like a lot of the stuff I play on my radio show are too good not to be played. Right. Well, I would imagine it's it's got to be kind of hard to find, uh, you know, newer musicians that would be able to get that same vibe and energy, because you guys really were on the forefront. Everything was so different when the Ramones started out. Definitely. Uh, at the time, uh, disco was big, uh stadium rock, soft rock, and the, what happened to the two-minute song. You'd buy an album, that were out, the albums were the big thing then, and uh, you'd have four or five songs on an album. Each each side would have uh, only two, two or three songs, and they would be ten minutes long. And you'd get, you would get, uh, well, I, we would get kind of like... Uh, not really disgusted, but we would wonder where what happened to the good, cool two-minute song, you know? Right. Well, punk rock music really isn't today what it used to be, is it? Um, well, they they took the elements of the Ramones, the Clash, and the Pistols and molded it, molded it into what I guess they, you know, feel it is. But it it isn't the same. I mean, uh, you know, uh, you can't really imitate... Uh, a genre of music that started something. I mean, you you can try to, but to really uh, uh, have the impact that that era did is is a pretty hard thing to uh, recreate. Now, I know it's a story you've probably told a billion times, but for our listeners who haven't heard it before, how did you actually get involved with Ramones? Because you actually started out playing uh, with some, playing drums for other bands. You started with Dust and Richard Hell and the Void Aids, right? Yeah, I was uh, in my, uh, I was 16, uh, yeah, 16 when I did my first album with a band called Dust in, uh, in, in, um, in high school. And then I uh, started hanging out in New York. I started hanging out at CBGB's in Max's, Kansas City. That was the name of another club. And then we all, all of us became friends. 
uh, me, Dee Dee, uh, Johnny, Joey, uh, Tommy, and uh, Debbie Harry, and uh, Richard Hell, and Johnny Thunders, and guys from the Dolls, and the uh, guys uh, from television, Talking Heads, and we all, it was really just uh, a, a, a camaraderie that we all developed over the years, and uh, when Tommy decided to uh, leave the band and produce, they they asked me to play with them. It was first it was Dee Dee, then it was John, and uh, and then uh, they gave me a tape of Road to Ruin, uh, a demo of Road to Ruin, and their live show. And I had to learn that in two weeks. Mm. So uh, that, that's really uh, that's that that's how it went. It was just that's really what was happening at the time in seventy four, seventy five, seventy six. Well, I got a really big kick out of you in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction because when uh, they were giving their speeches and everything, you definitely gave homage to Tommy. You said you just tried to emulate his beats as good as you could. Yeah, uh, Tommy uh, had that style, and uh, I was doing a lot of different kind of drumming with Richard Hell and the Vaudoids, but the Ramones were just really uh, eighth note uh, downstrokes, and uh, especially with the hi hat and the cymbals and uh, the guitar strumming so that's what created the wall of sound and then when i uh started doing it uh it was, it was just different it wasn't hard for me uh, i always used my fingers and wrists when i played anyway because i was i always liked jazz players so uh after a while it just uh the flow uh ended up being a lot better into each song when Dee, Dee would go one two three four so you know, it was uh, it, it, I did. You have to pay homage to people who who helped uh, who helped you. You know, I mean that's important. Well, we really enjoyed Ramones Raw, and I know you had a lot to do with that. And it became oh, thank you. the biggest selling DVD of the Ramones ever. Yeah. Uh, what was it like putting that together? I mean, I imagine a lot of it really brought back a lot of memories too. You know. Well, yeah, you had the skeletons come out of the closet, and uh, I carried three cameras around the world uh, when we toured. And uh, I would film everything. Uh, then one camera would die and break, and I had to get rid of it and use the other one. Uh, I w I'd always make sure I'd have backup, and uh, that was the result. That was raw. And um, it really is just a very personal footage that anyone could do, but uh, I did it for eight years. So uh, I put all that together, and then we added some... Uh, TV appearances, some rare, uh, obscure things, and uh, put it all together. The reason that it was really good to me is it was totally real. I mean, a lot of people that, that bring out things that tell a story kind of like sugarcoat it, and this was it. I mean, it told us the way it was right on down with kind of the, the love-hate relationship, I mean, with the fights and everything, too, you know? Yeah, it is what it was. Uh, Johnny and uh, Joey didn't get along, and that created a lot of problems in the band, but we persevered. And uh, we uh, didn't let it affect us on stage, but uh, in the end, uh, the uh, re uh, the results were the music, and that's what really speaks for itself. Absolutely. So, what about you now? Talk about you know the music you're doing now with uh, your new. Well, group. I got Michael Graves uh, on vocals. I got two people from a band called Anti Product, and I I went through a lot of musicians uh, everywhere to see who was the best. And this lineup so far uh, is the most professional. And I'm going to keep them as long as I continue wanting to do this. So uh, I'm playing shows uh, in Europe. I just did some European uh, festivals with the Pistols and uh, uh, let me see, who else? Uh, Offspring. And uh, then... Uh, we're going to do some shows in uh, Mexico, and we're going to do shows in Japan. Very cool. Then we're going to take it to America, and possibly, uh, if it uh, doesn't interfere with the calendar, do some shows on the Warp Tour, and then uh, continue the radio show and uh, do the DJ stuff. But uh, I'm coming out with a, a clothesline on uh, Tommy uh, Hilfiger jeans, uh, Hilfiger uh, denim, it's called. They he Tommy was a, is a friend of mine, and he approached me, or well, the company did, and they asked if I would do a Marky Ramon clothesline, and I never des never thought of that in a million years. So uh, <laughs> I designed a leather jacket 
jeans and uh, t-shirts, so that should be out this month. So uh, now I'm a designer. So <laughs> there you go. There you <laughs> go. It's pretty yeah. unusual. And I I grew up with Tommy when he was selling clothes out of the trunk of his car. Oh wow! And uh, I respect a guy like that. And he was always into punk and rock, and always uh, managed to uh, be around when I would be rehearsing and or something in a club. So we got to know each other, and he's really uh, a, a great guy, and a guy who uh, whose story should be known because it really is uh, a dream come true with him. Well, just think about what you've done and what the legacy of the Ramones have done, because fashion designers like that are known for high fashion, and you're bringing out a high fashion line of leather jackets and jeans. Who would ever imagine? You know. Well, I made I made sure that the costs weren't too high. I mean, uh, I want I want people. To uh, n- not to kill them, especially in this economy now. Right. Uh, you know, you can't go around selling leather jackets for two thousand dollars and jeans for four or five hundred dollars. You got to keep the price affordable, and th- I made sure of that. Uh, y- you know, I mean, the the quality of the leather is very good, uh, and the quality of the clothes are good, and that's what was the first thing to me uh, that it's not just going to be another T-shirt company. Uh, that sells rock and roll merchandise, and uh, two months later, this thing fade, fades and rips. Mm-hmm. This is quality stuff, and uh, to me, that was important. Well, I appreciate the fact that you spoke out against AIDS to actually sell a uh, Ramones tin with condoms, right? Yep. And you said you had a lot of friends that passed away with AIDS. You want to make sure that didn't happen. Uh, I had two friends who passed away, and uh, they I saw them disintegrate in front of me. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was new then. Um, you know, nobody, uh, people looked down on it. Uh, and and they, they weren't uh, gay. Uh, you know, a lot of people thought it was just gay people that, that had this, this, this disease. So, you know, there was a lot of bigotry and prejudice towards that. So uh, when I was asked to do this line, I remembered that stuff uh, in the 80s, how people reacted to that. And... Uh, if I can save a life or bring it, bring that to the attention of somebody, and if you know uh, people uh, realize that anyone can get it, uh, I think it's a good thing. And I think that uh, hopefully with this new administration, uh, we won't be so squeamish to at least address this issue in schools and and even in churches. I mean, you know. Uh, uh, for pe you know, uh, God, a, a godly thing is something where you go out there and save lives and you help people, not to ignore it and put it down. Mm-hmm. So I just uh, hope that uh, uh, people become more educated about uh, HIV. You know, right? All that stuff. Well, it's really great you're in a position to do what you do and get the message out because a lot of people are, but. They don't. A lot of people <laughs> don't want to do it yeah. or, or afraid to because they feel uh, it's too political or they'll lose they'll lose their fan base. So to, I, I don't. To me, I don't care. I, I I know I'm doing the right thing and uh, and that's important. You know. I often get in a lot of arguments when it comes up as to who were the Godfathers and invented <laughs> punk music. I always say you guys. What do you personally believe? Everyone always says the Sex Pistols. Well, they weren't together yet. When That's what Ramones, I said. <laughs> yeah, when the Ramones started, they were they weren't even around. Malcolm came to New York and uh, wanted Richard Helen in the Sex Pistols. He said no, <laughs> but uh, the Ramones started the sound and uh, the uh, speed and the counting into each song and uh, no ridiculous uh, minute and a half guitar solos. Uh, and then uh, England picked up on it. So in the history books, you you could look at the dates when bands started. Johnny Ron was basically a long-haired uh, 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 bar guy, and so was uh, the, the other guys. They weren't the pub rock. Uh, that was what was going on before punk rock started. And then uh, Malcolm showed them all the stuff, what was going on in New York, and they had had their own fashion. It was more fashionable, uh, the punk rock in England. It was more about the sensationalism and fashion and, uh, compared to the sound. What they would do is a lot of the, the English bands would take the Ramones sound 
and put a, 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 a safety pin in their ear. You know, that's right. really what it was. It, it was strange too because a lot of the punk bands were known for being violent and they would even urinate on their audience and everything and you guys were relatively well behaved compared to them <laughs> yet all the other bands thought you guys were going to kick their ass at the show yeah we we didn't need to do that and we felt it was you don't piss on your fans and you don't spit <laughs> on your fans and all that stuff uh, uh, unfortunately a lot of groups had to do that to uh, garner some kind of attention yeah. right and uh that to me, that's the uh, lowest co- common denominator because uh, you know what else is is there? L- what's left to do? You know what I mean? So uh, obviously uh, those groups aren't around anymore. Yeah. So we uh, we just persevered and continued to do it our way. Well, and I feel it had a lot to do for 22 years with the fact that you guys were were down home New York boys too. Like uh, we uh, interviewed PJ Souls a few years ago. I love her, yeah, that's and, right. and she told me this great story that right after the movie, she invited all you guys over for Thanksgiving meal, and she had the whole spread out. But she said you guys looked a little disappointed. Didn't really want the turkey. Was you wanted hamburgers or pizza or something like that? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We were uh, you know pizza, hamburger lovers, hot dogs, and uh, French fries and, uh, you know, all that stuff. But uh, uh, I'm sure we nibbled. But the uh, <laughs> thing is that if you, we were rehearsing or being in a studio or backstage, we would always have our pizzas delivered and, uh, you know, the uh, the French fries and the uh, Burger King, McDonald's, you know, uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken, so uh, we we kind of uh, liked all the, the, the junk food, the fast food, you know? Well, I must tell you, one of your biggest fans, and maybe you know this, but a lot of people may not even guess this, is Miss Togar, the one and only, okay? She loves you, and that's Mary Warnoff. And she uh, said, you guys are great. Oh, really? So yeah, did I. I was doing the movie. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good way to get good grades in school, you know? Yeah, I was 22, <laughs> and uh, we were doing the It was, no, 23, I think. And we were uh, doing the doing the movie, and there she was. You know, she was she was. Uh, I mean, you know, just uh, because she was wearing the conservative clothing, you know, that was kind of like you know a whole different era. But it didn't matter. It didn't matter. I just had this crush. You know. Well, she she quite enjoyed talking about how when punk the punk scene hit, that <clears throat> she basically divorced her husband, put on a dog collar, and uh, <clears throat> ran around being. 16 again so. well that's that's uh, a good reason exactly I mean, you know you only live once you know well she was part of that whole thing too because she uh, toured around with Lou Reed and that so you yeah. know uh, Andy Warhol Lou, they they uh, Lou Reed uh, you know Sweet Jane and all that stuff I mean uh, they they had elements of punk but a lot of it was considered garage rock yeah uh, we uh, and you know and, and uh, acid drug rock but I always loved uh, Walk on the Wild Side, uh, the Sweet Jane, and I play I play them on my radio show. Uh, and they would those those uh, those guys girls would come see us at CBGB's. Mm. Andy Warhol, Reed, uh, John Cale. They would always wonder how do they get their sound, and you know they were like. Oh, the, everybody always asks, "How do you guys get that sound?" And I said, "It's very simple. We play eighth note downstrokes." So a lot of punk bands couldn't figure that out, or it was too hard for them. And you know, uh, get, getting off the subject about Lou Reed, the thing is that when you see a lot of these punk bands, they play fast, but they're not playing Ramones fast. Right. right. They're going up and down on the chords, not down completely with the eighth notes. So you'll hear a lot of fast punk, but it's easier to play that way than it is the Ramones way. What do you think about the critics that said that a lot of your songs sound the same? We love it. We loved it. Uh, we uh, we did Sheena, well, Tommy did Sheena's a punk rock, and then I did Rock on High School. Uh, sounds the same, but the the songs uh, to everyone that I know love them. They love those songs. Uh, when I first heard the first album. Uh, I thought the same thing. I, I thought that they all sounded the same. But when I saw them live before the first album came out at CBGB's, I was just more impressed with the energy and the way there was no uh, 
uh, interruptions with uh, 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 talking, and uh, they just went right into the song. So, uh, yeah, I'm sure there's there's a lot of songs that, that are similar. So what ended up kind of driving you guys, I don't know if maybe you were all fans of the genre or, or what the deal was, but you guys actually did quite a few songs for horror movie soundtracks, things like Pet Cemetery and Texas Chainsaw. How did you guys get involved in doing that? Uh, well, the Pet Cemetery song, we, uh, we went to, uh, to dinner with uh, Stephen King at his house, and uh, we uh, saw the book, and Dee Dee uh, read it, and then all of a sudden, the next thing we knew, uh, he wrote the song. And uh, we um, were very surprised that it was in the movie, and uh, it, I think it's in the end credits. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was a big seller for us. We were very happy that uh, that, that came out at that particular time. And uh, we were always uh, Stephen King fans, and we were surprised uh, that that he liked us, you know, because he, he's, he's Stephen King, you know. That video really bothers me to watch it now, and you see a lot of them that have passed walking in the cemetery. It's really kind of surreal now, you know. What is that? I said that, that video really bothers me now because it's oh, really yeah, surreal. Too. Yeah, you see a lot of the, the ones that pass walking through the cemetery. It's oh, yeah. hard uh, to take. The Vedas, uh, Joey, uh, Johnny, Dee Dee, they're gone. And yeah. I'm with Joey going into the grave. You know, we're together mm-hmm. uh, in the video, so it's very, very strange. And uh, and and the weird part of that video is when it turns black and white. Uh, yeah. That was very strange. I think it was uh, at the end when we're walking away. Uh, it really uh, it makes you think, you know. Uh, you're a really good friend with Joey. You actually worked with him on a solo album, right? Yeah, yeah. That was a good album. Uh, he always wanted to do a solo album. He was sick while making the album. He had to come out of the uh, hospital to do the album and then go back into the hospital. So the doctor gave him a few hours off when he was able to record, and then he had to go back. So at least his dream uh, came true to make a solo album. And uh, What a Wonderful World uh, came out really good. And we were always proud of that song. And I play that in my set, too, as, uh, you know, uh, to remembering Joey. Right. right. So do you know of any songs of the Ramones that haven't been released? I know sometimes they come out with stuff. Uh, Disney released a lot of the Queen stuff. Of course, they jacked up the price like double when they wound up on their label. But is there anything unheard? Honestly, no. Uh, everything's been reissued on the uh, albums that were expanded by Warner Brothers, um, uh, Rhino. So, uh, no, that, that's really it. The, the repertoire is pretty much out there, all of it. Uh, I, I would know. Uh, but there were some demos lying around of Joey's, and I think that maybe there might be another Joey album, but uh, I, I don't want to do that. I, I, I thought one was enough. Yeah, and him not being there was just just too uh, a little too strange for me to deal with. You know, I kind of got over it. Right. But uh, you never do. But I. But luckily, I did, and I uh, suggested maybe get uh, uh, somebody. You know, somebody else. You know. Mm-hmm. You know, something that's always been bugging me. One of the uh, rock and roll high school actors that we interviewed was uh, Dick Miller, who played Officer Paisley. Right. And. He actually told me he wasn't a fan of you guys because he said that there was an incident on the set to where it was some girl's birthday on the set and one of you took your hand and shoved it in her cake and kind of like broke the cake up. Do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, I think it was Dee Dee. Ah, <laughs> it sounds like it would have been Dee Dee. Yeah. <laughs> well, now you solve the mystery because I've always wondered who it was. He, he never told me which one. Yeah, we were always a fan of his. <laughs> always a fan. We loved him. <laughs> Well, uh, Marky, while we're while we're doing the show, we actually have a chat room going where a lot of listeners can come in and submit questions to have asked of the guest. And one of our listeners wanted to find out if we could ask you if there was a story behind why the Ramones never played Dee Dee's song "Chinese Rocks." Uh, why didn't we? Yeah. Uh, I, I, we did. We played it live. Uh, 
I'm not sure. I mean, the heart, I think because there's a band called Johnny Thunders and the Heartbreakers. Mm-hmm. Dee Dee wrote the song. Uh, they did it, but we always felt that they did it better. So there were, most of the times we didn't do it. But um, I do it uh, with uh, my band because it's a good song. Uh, the uh, lyrical content, uh, I wouldn't uh, uh, suggest anyone to... Uh, to really t- take it to heart, but it is it is about you know drugs, so that could have been another reason you know. Right. You know, you always gave your opinion on Phil Spector, and you always said that you saw that he did have guns, but you never really saw him ever draw them. Uh, yeah. Somebody in the chat room said there was a rumor going around that he chased you guys around the studio with a gun. Well, that's not true, is it? No, I don't know where they got that info from because. Uh, I was in the studio all the time, and uh, he had a license to carry, and uh, sometimes uh, I'm sure a gun with ammunition in it could get heavy, so mm-hmm. he would take the gun out and put it on the table. He would never wave it around it at, at point it at us. I mean, you, you got a gun there, uh, you better use it uh, if you're going to point it at somebody, and if he was going to shoot us, he'd have no band to produce. Right. So, I mean, you know, all these rumors are ridiculous. Yeah. Somebody in the room said he heard... I did shoot up at the ceiling when he did an album with John Lennon. Oh, okay. He did He did uh, take out guns in front of Leonard Cohen. But with us, yeah, the guns were out, but he didn't a- aim it foolishly uh, at us. And uh, th- those are just... It's like a game of telephone. Yeah. Say something at the end of the line, it's totally different, the story. So that's what really happened. He he was uh, uh, assaulted as a kid. He uh, it was very traumatic to him, and uh, eventually he got a bodyguard, uh, and then he got his own license to carry a uh, gun. So there you go. You know. Well, somebody in the room said they thought that, that might have come from uh, Dee Dee, but I'm not sure that's true either. Dee Dee had a very. Uh, uh, how can I say it? Imagination uh, or a sense of humor? Uh, a, a very uh, creative uh, uh, imagination. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Uh, let's. He was one. Of, he is the main songwriter of the band. He was, and uh, he could um, tell stories uh, very well. And a lot of the times they were exaggerated and. Uh, if you read one of his books, you can tell right away that uh, a, a lot of it was just uh, hearsay with him. Uh, uh, Phil Spector never pointed a gun at Dee Dee. I'm glad to hear that. Really am. Well, I mean, you guys did everything. I mean, of course, you were in rock and roll high school, so you were actors, you were mu- musicians, producers, <laughs> Actually, writers. We had, uh, I think I had one line. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a great line. It was a great line, though. <laughs> I forgot what it was. <laughs> <laughs> but you guys were even animated. You guys appeared on The Simpsons, right? Yeah, yeah. That was cool. That has to be interesting. Like, you're not really doing the voice when you're, you're doing... I mean, you do the voice separately, like you're in a little room, right? Is that yeah, how they we, well, they came to the studio in New York, and they uh, got us separately in a booth, and they... Uh, said say your part so my part was gee i think they liked us <laughs> <laughs> and uh but i i had to say it 10 different times because i have a, a brooklyn accent mm-hmm. so i had to kind of like get rid of it a little bit but leave it in to so people knew it was me saying it yeah. not, not not another actor or voiceover but uh that's how simple that was and what he did was he took an eight by ten photo and uh, he used a lot of that that and integrated it in, into his artwork. You know, the, the thing that's great about you is you so fit with the radio station. Not only do you have a collection of wind-up robot toys, <laughs> oh, yeah. but you actually owned the Black Beauty from the Green Hornet? Uh, 1965 Chrysler Imperial. Imperial. Wow. Um, and uh, it... Uh, it was a great car. Let me guess, it never ran. It, no, it, it, was, it was 100%, <laughs> but let me tell you what happened. Uh, I had it all redone, except for the, uh, the master cylinder was done for the car. That affects the brakes. 
<clears throat> but the uh, uh, fluid that the uh, cylinders that house the fluid near mm-hmm. the uh, uh, wheels, it, it, one day the fluid ran out, mm-hmm. and it only had one reservoir. The car, the car, it was a five thousand pound car. So uh, when you have one reservoir and the liquid runs out, all the brakes don't work. Yeah. If you have a double reservoir, which came in 66, 67, uh, if two brakes went out, you still had your rear or front, you know, whatever, whichever, you know, ones were being used, you know, uh, with, with the reservoir, that the brake fluid, which was, uh, which was in the uh, front uh, near the engine. So I'm driving along about 50 miles an hour in the car, no brakes. Ooh. Uh, I'm with my one of my roadies. He starts uh, flipping out, and we're on a uh, three-lane highway. Oh. So I uh, see a bunch of weeds uh, on the side of the highway, and I go up on the highway, and the weeds is what stopped the car. Luckily, there was no accident. I was able to maneuver, but that was the end of the car. I can can you imagine, that. Marky, like somebody stopping to help another driver, like a pedestrian stopping, and there is a black beauty with Marky Ramon in it? <laughs> you, you could see it in Raw. It's in Raw. <laughs> Fantastic. If, if you see it, if you see it, you'll see it in Raw. But uh, unfortunately, now uh, they make things for those years uh, that you can buy, uh, and uh, you know, just put them in the car, and they're more advanced. Yeah. But at the time, uh, in the early 90s, they didn't build that yet. Well, we don't want to hold you too long because we know you're a busy man, and we, we so appreciate We've been working on this for a while, and special thanks to your manager that helped us out with this. Uh, we did, uh, yeah, want to, did want to mention you do have a DVD coming out, The Job That Ate My Brain. Yeah, uh, two and a half years in the making, and uh, it's about my whole story, everything, since I was two years old. All the way up to now, uh, there's about 40, I think 45 interviews. Mm-hmm. Ozzy's in it, uh, Steve Tyler's in it, Dave Grohl's in it, Debbie Harry's in it, Tommy's in it. Uh, the, this, I mean, it, the list goes on and on and on. And, and uh, it really just uh, is a, uh, a whole thing about my, my time in the punk scene and Growing up and uh, where I went to high school, junior high school, where I lived, the houses that I lived in, and uh, the bands I played in for rare footage, and um, you know, uh, it's it's uh, pretty pretty comprehensive. Then you got a website coming out of your own too, right? Soon it'll be called uh, just uh, immarkyramon.com, but I do have a, a really cool MySpace. Mm-hmm. It's just uh, Marky Ramon and MySpace, and uh, you can. Uh, see what's happening uh, at this point uh, with what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to this uh, thing in California called the, the NAM Convention. Well, you just go there and uh, you look at all the products that are coming out from different musical companies. And uh, then from there, I guess I'm going to go to the Phil Spector court case because, you know, he asked me to come down. Mm-hmm. Are you going to witness for him? or oh, What's that? you going to witness for him? No, I'm, I'm going to just be uh, there to observe the situation. Mm-hmm. That, that was really strange. I didn't really think they'd bring that. You know, he got out of it the first time, and I didn't really think they'd bring it up again. I well, mean, that's almost that's like double problem. indemnity, isn't it? Well, the problem is that uh, I, I mean, I know the whole story. I, I think he's innocent. I was with him Christmas, and uh, I, you know, the 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 whole situation is just insane. I mean, everyone has their own story, but look, just just because the guy had guns on him and doesn't make him a murderer, you know, right. that's a whole different ball game, you know. Even though he's a great man, the one that's really guilty is Roger Corman for making Rock and Roll High School forever <laughs> with, with Corey Haim. I mean, Feldman. not Corey, Corey oh, Feldman, God. excuse me. Did, did he even ask you guys to do the second film? Uh, no, I think by that time we graduated. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Mark. You got it. Thank such you. an honor to have you on. Thank you, Marky. Okay. All right, you got. You have a wonderful night. Thanks.